Hey, it's Ridge Runner again. Uh, I do love my Henry single shot. I, there's only one thing I hate about it, and I just sent an email to Henry about that. We'll see how long it takes them to answer me and so what their thoughts are on fixing the issue. That's the one problem. It, it is an accurate gun. I've shot the groups. I've got some right here. I'll, sh I'll show you the aftermath of the groups. Uh, you've seen on my other videos of it hitting at 100. Now, I did put the Leopold SABR scope on our 3x9 uh, the 40, the Henry EGW one piece rail, Picatinny rail, and I had these Weaver uh, quad lock rings that I put on there. Uh, and I bought the hammer spur from uh, Henry, and yeah, I think it's a Groove Tech, and put it on there. Uh, the one thing that I do not like about this rifle, well, two things actually, two. Number one is all your other rifles, 243 or whatever, if you look at them, the front sight is like right in here, on top right in here. You can still use this rail and the scope. I really, really, really wanted to keep my rear sight on here. Worst case scenario, you have to pull something off, you know, uh, but, uh, well, okay, fine. I, I can't, my vision, I can't use the open sights all that well anyway. So I'll just stick with a good quality optic like Leopold or Burris. I love Burris scopes. I got a lot of Burris scopes. This is my second Leopold. My first one was okay. It was that AR scope. It done all right. I liked it. Uh, glass to me wasn't as clear as my burr scopes, so uh, I got this off Michael. Now this is pretty clear. This is this is better than that uh, AR scope I had was as far as clarity goes. The main issue I have with this Henry single shot, and I think I showed you in the woods how pretty the wood is on it. Yeah, I've got this on there to carry. It's a single shot, so. You got to be able to carry this and holds uh, one, two, eight rounds, nine rounds. It's a uh, Allen, just a little old cheap, four ninety nine or three ninety nine, something like that. Allen shell holder. I did uh, cut me a little hole in it so I could hook it up, put my sling on. This is a leather sling I got off Amazon. This piece here, I'm going to figure out a way to get it to stay down. Uh, I like the sling. I've got it adjusted to where when I throw it up and put my arm through there and pull back on it, and it holds pretty tight. I mean, it holds, I mean, I'm pretty stable right there, so offhand shooting with this leather sling is better than the nylon slings, in my opinion. I, I just, I like this. I figured, though, yeah, it don't look traditional, you know, the color and stuff, but hey, it looks good enough. You know, and it's leather. I just keep it with, uh, uh, saddle soap on it keep it clean I just need to mount this bottom piece down here to where it don't you know flop around the main issue I have with this rifle that I just sent an email to Henry about you got nine shells in your holder single shot you throw it up say you you know you throw it up you cock it and you get on a bear or a wild boar. You pull a trigger, it fires. Well, you break it down, shell's still in the chamber. It does not eject. Uh, I think that could have some a spring behind it. Their shotguns eject shells. Out. I don't know why. In their owner's manual, it says a lot of uh, hand loaders like to be able to save their brass. Well, I hand load for almost, almost every caliber I've got. And <laughs> my bolt actions kick the shells out when I open it and close it. I don't mind to go hunt for them. My semi-automatics kick the shells out. I don't mind to go hunt for them. If I don't find them, it's no big deal. Brass is not as expensive as my life. If a bear or a wild hog is coming straight at me. But anyway, you'd break it down, get this shell, pull it out, throw it on the ground anyway. Pick one up out of here, drop it in close it, cock it, get back on target. 
you might think, well, you get used to it, you can, and yeah, you probably could do it pretty quick, but the thing is, when you pop that open, look at it like this. You're looking here, you fire, you pop that open, it drops down. It should throw the shell out over here. You could grab another shell, drop in, pop it like a cock it back on target. That's a little faster than pulling the shell case out, throwing it on the ground, picking the other one up, putting it in. It just, to me, it defeats the whole purpose. If it was a, this is a 4570. This is not something you're gonna sit down at the bench and shoot targets with all day long. You could, but I'm not. This I got for a hunting rifle to take any game that I wanted to take with it. I'm going to sit down and shoot and sight it in. Once I get it sighted in and get my loads worked out to what load I'm going to shoot in it, I'm going to zero it according to my ballistics calculator where I can get the best overall use out of my uh, uh, reticle in my scope. Then that's it. I'm going to load every, every buy brass and bullets and load all that at same load and sorry I'm getting back all in my teeth uh, or I can just grab it and the ammo go out the door huh, I know it's on no big deal but I emailed Henry if there was a way that they could put a spring in this because it does move in and out right there at the very end and if you come down to here Right there, see how much that moves in and out? That could be in, and when it reaches this point, the spring could be behind it, and it could shove that out and kick a shell out, even if it fell right here and just fell off the side. I don't care, I'd like it to eject it itself. And, but I see, I mean, their shotguns eject, so why not have the rifles eject? Yeah, hand loaders, do want to save their brass but I'm sure they wouldn't mind looking around to pick up a piece of brass or forget about a piece of brass if they was able to save their life and if you got it loaded and you want to unload it and it's got a loaded ground in it when you break it you put your hand over it it kicks it out and you hit your fingers and stops then you get a hold of it and pull it out put it back in the side close it back you're done uh, I love this rifle. It's a beautiful rifle. Top notch, good, A number one quality. Uh, it shoots good. I'll show you the groups from the other day in a minute. But I wanted to get that gripe off of my hand. So I'll see how Anthony Imperato, however you say his name, and Henry actually handles my request. If they could send me a spring and tell me how to take it apart, change that, or if they want me to send it in to them and them change it that's up to them but i would like for it to actually eject the shell instead of me having to pull it out you know i understand their concept of well hand loaders you know well, that's fine i hand load but if i'm hunting i want that shell out and me throw another one in i want to be the fastest reloading possible to keep an animal from getting to me depending on what i'm hunting coyotes wolves uh Black bear, grizzly bear, brown bear, you know, elk, moose, they're apparently notoriously grumpy, uh, elephant, cape buffalo, whatever you're hunting with a 4570 in a single shot, you want to be able to get a reload as fast as possible. So anyway, that is that. Now, this was the group with the IMR 8208 XBR, okay? It actually measures, I measured from where the, you'll notice where the lead mark is on the paper, outside to outside, top to bottom. I measured that and then minus the diameter of the bullet, which will give you a center to center uh, group, which this was actually 1.198. 1.198 and 
This one was 2,209 foot per second. And the recoil between it and the 2,113 foot per second on the uh, IMR 3031 powder, which everybody says that 3031 is a good powder for that, and I, and I believe it. But I like the temperature and sensitivity because with the 3031, you're getting freezing weather, you're going to lose velocity. You're getting extremely hot weather, you're going to gain velocity. Uh, with 8208, it might fluctuate some, but it's not going to be as much as the 3031 would be. Anyway, 1.198 on the 8208. So what I've done, this is a half a grain below max charge. I went in, and now I am, see, 60. I am two and a half grains above the starting charge, which is two and a half grains below the max charge. I'm dead center in the middle. I dropped my powder charge because this one was a starting charge on the 3031 and it shot a tighter group. So I dropped my powder charge on this, loaded exact same load, just dropped the powder charge two and a half grains. And I'm hoping this group will tighten up. If this group will tighten up as tight as the 3031 group, then I'll use it. Let's see. Here's IMR 3031. Now, after I rewatched the video, the top hole right here was the first shot. Then the second shot come down here. Then the third shot went back right here. Well, them two's in the same hole, as you can tell. Uh, then the, I had a fourth one. I put it in and shot it, and it hit right here. Well, if you measure them last three shots, you know, the fourth shot, and the first and the third shot, it measures 0 0.898 inches at 100 yards. That's pretty good. I mean, that's under an inch. It's almost three quarters of an inch. But that one flyer really bothered me. I couldn't figure out why I would have a flyer. Only thing I can figure was when I was seating them, I was adjusting on my crimp also. I got them seated, and then I tried to adjust my crimp and adjust and it. One, and I re-measured all of them. One of them, that's supposed to be in a 2.550. One of them, I had, I checked my notes when I got home. Uh, one of them was at 2.543. Uh, that's seven thousandths. I know five thousandths will make a difference as far as accuracy goes. But I didn't think it'd be throw one out that bad. It could have been the primer too. It could have been the shell case weighing more than others. I didn't weigh the shell cases. Uh, but that's not bad. And these little marks right here, I laid that other group up over top of this one. You know, putting this here where I was, because that circle in the scope perfectly centers right around that orange three inch circle at 100 yards and one two three then markings are one two three that's where that other group is so if you used to count them three and these three you'd have a six shot group that measured what was it two inches two point Yeah, just over two inches. It measured just over two inches between all six of them at 100 yards. And they're hitting so close to the same relative, you know, you got one, two, and three. This up here, oh, let's see, yeah. That one, is. you can mark it off because I had the paper wrong when I marked it the first time. But, I mean, you get them three, I can stick it over it and show you. the circles are up exactly right okay see the little marks through the holes see where they are them two and that in there so if I can get by dropping the powder charge on this one if this group will tighten up like the 3031 will then I'll use it 
this I thought was a fly or something. The, that is some shrapnel. You can see a little bit of the metal stain on the back. The metal post that goes up and around that the target was sitting on. One of these bullets right here hit it and bent it over and tore it out of the way. And that's like a eighth inch thick piece of steel. It bent it over and moved it out of the way because it caught the edge of it and it threw shrapnel. And that was, this right here is from a piece of shrapnel poked a hole in the cardboard. Anyway, and uh, 3031, I, I, I upped this uh, charge here one and a half grains above the starting charge. So it's not, it's, let's see. It is about two and a half grains below maximum charge. And this one is two and a half grains below maximum charge. They're pretty much both right dead center in the middle of the load category. I want to keep my velocity. I looked at my ballistics calculator, my street lock ballistics calculator, with both of these loads. One at 2200 and one at 2113 because that's what the 3031 came out to be. They, both of them, in that I'll draw it out if you've never seen that. I'll draw it out and do another video on that where they're hitting that. But inside the circle with it zeroed at 100 yards, you got a circle and you got crosshairs. And then you got a big dot down here below the circle and then a smaller dot and then you got the tip of the post, you know, right at the bottom. Well, if you zeroed at 100 from 2100 foot per second, crosshairs is 50 to 100, then, you know, down to 200, which is, you know, at the bottom of the circle. And then you got just a little over 300, like 311 or 300, then 308, something like that. And then you got, you know, almost 400. And then you got just below the tip of the post sticking up. Here's a tip. It just about that far below it is 500. Works out pretty good. But anyway, uh, the 2200 works out even better than that. Uh, just by a few... Uh, uh, yards, you know, a couple of inches. It's, it's, they're both so close, it wouldn't matter either way. But I'm going to go out one day this week and shoot that load, them two loads, and see how they do, and then I'll decide between them two how they shoot, which ones I'm going to go with, and I'll let y'all know. Uh, Red Runner out, y'all have a good day.